Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we want to welcome everybody to this uh, second uh, session about uh, small rooming and webinar. The topic uh, that we are presenting today is on sheep and got uh, winter feeding. Uh, for sure, many questions will be answering uh, through the presentation uh, of our invited uh, speakers. And uh, you will me, uh, you, you, you may uh, write some of your questions in, in the chat and uh, Amy Bax will be managing those questions to the, to the speakers. Uh, Lincoln University of uh, Missouri is a 1890 land grant university and receives uh, supports from the USDA and the Agriculture Department of Missouri. I am uh, Homero Salinas, Extension State Specialist uh, here at Lincoln University. And now I will give the time to our invited speakers, uh, Linda and Ken Coffey, to present uh, by themselves. Thank you, Dr. Salinas. I'm Linda Coffey, and I grew up in Missouri, not very far from Lincoln University, actually. My hometown is Westphalia. I grew up on a livestock farm and raising sheep. Ken and I have raised sheep together since we moved to Kansas in 1986, and we've lived on our current farm in Arkansas since 1996. We have about 50 acres, about half of that is really grazable, and we run Gulf Coast sheep. We have about 40 ewes and, and their lambs and some alpine dairy goats. I work for the National Center for Appropriate Technology uh, have for the last 20 years. And what I do there, did you put a slide in? No. Oh, what I do there is I'm a livestock specialist working for the ATRA Information Service. And ATRA is your information service. You get great information in your state, and I, I hope that you take advantage of that. But we also have a national service, and I hope you will take advantage of that as well. I am a livestock specialist with sheep and goats as my specialty. You can reach me at lindac at ncat.org, and I will talk more about ATRA. Ken? Um, I'm Ken Coffey. Uh, I work for the University of Arkansas I'm in the ruminant nutrition area, focus on forages. And they ask us to talk about small ruminant nutrition, not about me. So I want to get on with the program. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Um, is that working okay, Amy? Yes, yes, I can see it. Okay. Before Great. you get started, I have a little bit of housekeeping. So um, everybody, hi, I'm Amy Vax. I am an extension associate here with the Small Ruminant Program at Lincoln University. Um, I'm gonna be monitoring the chat. So if you guys have questions, um, go ahead and just put them in the chat and I'll feed them to our speakers as needed. Um, if there's concepts that you just don't understand and you want them to go over more thoroughly, just let me know and we'll slow down. If we need to speed up, because this is easy peasy and you all know it, I'm sure Dr. Ken can handle uh, advancing the information if you need it. Um, at the end of the live presentation, there will be a survey monkey and that helps us deliver the best programming to you possible. So I'm gonna drop that survey monkey into the chat and please follow the link and that again will help us um, from the last one. We have a new topic we hadn't even considered and it's gonna come up later in our series. So we're, we're flexing to see what you guys want. So be sure and put all that information in the chat and I will follow up with you um, as we go along. So housekeeping over, go right ahead. Okay, uh, we are asked to talk about winter feeding for small ruminants. And so I wanna jump into that, but Again, if you have questions about something that we just said, please fire that question to Amy. That's, that's what's important to us as we answer the questions. Uh, you know, we've done this a long time. We've made lots and lots of mistakes. And so we talk more from experience than we do from anything else. So, um, all right. So I, Missouri, North Arkansas, we have fescue as our base forage and so um, really thought it was appropriate to start by talking about stockpile fescue and then how good is that how well does that meet the requirements of our sheep well here is 
what we call TDN or total digestible nutrients. That's, some, that's a way we measure energy or refer to energy in the diet. And so as a percent of the diet, first thing you see at maintenance, stockpile fescue, regardless of when it is, it meets their maintenance requirements and it also meets their requirements for early gestation, whether it's a sheep, a meat dough, or a dairy dough. Now, where we start getting into, into higher needs are in late gestation, early lactation. So it comes down to when is your lambing season? And I know it's all over the board. We like lambing in the winter. Uh, I know uh, the, a couple of weeks ago, the speakers talked about that. They don't want to lamb in the winter time. Well, we do because it gets our lambs to market sooner and we don't have to deal with so many in the summertime, which is a bad time for us. So, um, but the quality of stockpile fescue in the fall runs about 65% TDN. And by fall, we're talking about November, December. Um, however, as we progress through the winter, the quality, the quality of that stuff, sorry about that, uh, the quality of that forage goes down to about 55%. So in the early fall, it meets the requirements of sheep even through early lactation with twins where uh, as we get further into winter, it's lower quality. And if we look at the protein content, protein content of stockpile fescue is, is high. It holds its quality. That's a beauty of it. And I guess maybe I should say by stockpile fescue, what I mean is some fescue that you grazed off or clipped back in, back in the summer. And this is all growth starting in August, September. And so it's growth that occurs during that time period. Uh, and then we just let it keep growing. And because of the structure of tall fescue, it really holds its quality well. So 15% protein on that early or on the, in the fall, but it does decline to about 11% in the winter. But still, the main requirement that we have for these animals is energy. Protein is, is not as, as, much, as much of a limiting nutrient for these animals. All right, so then the question becomes, well, when should we use this? Because I've already mentioned about the about the differences there as the season progresses. So when do we use this? Well, I found this information and this is out of North Carolina, but I think it still has a lot of application to us is percent green forage. And if we think, why is that important? Well, because these animals want to eat the green forage, the dead stuff, they really don't want to eat very well. So, uh, but in October, 80% green and it declines after that. And so we get out here in February, it may only be about 25 to 30% actual green forage that those sheep are gonna eat. So if we leave it out here till January before we start grazing it, a lot of that forage has turned brown. It's starting to, uh, to senesce and go, go downhill on quality. Another important factor can to consider is the ergovaline concentrations. Tall fescue, most of it that's around is toxic. It has these ergot alkaloids, ergovaline is the most prominent one, and it's blamed for a lot of negative impacts that we'll talk about in a little bit, but here's where the trade-offs come in. We, we always wait for, and I will talk more about that later, but we always wait to start grazing our stockpile fescue out here until after we get a hard freeze. And that's because after the hard freezes, that ergo, those ergovaline levels start declining. But if you notice, based on that previous graph, that this is oftentimes, you know, it, it looks like it's pretty similar trend to what we saw with that percent green forage. So we're losing green forage, but we're losing ergovaline as well. So here's what it looks like in our case, because a lot of times we may not start grazing it until mid to late December, 
but we'll run a fence and this area to the left is where they grazed previously and they leave all that dead forage that uh, that non-green forage they they leave they select out the green so then ultimately how do we use stockpile fescue well to get the most efficient use out of it we like to strip graze it and that's the general recommendations and this is a picture of a this was just a perfect situation it was a fairly large pasture and we were able to run this three strand electric fence across it and give them about three feet a day and the animals would line up literally like they were at a feed bunk and start eating and they would eat their way when they got to the fence we would move it another three feet and so we really utilize this well. And then they can defecate and urinate out here on the rest of the pasture. Well, we've gotten more intensive in our rotation. And so we've got a lot more smaller pastures. And so we run net fence across it now. And we have to give them a little bigger area because our pastures are more narrow. But again, you see there's a strong contrast between what they haven't eaten and what they have eaten uh, and what they've picked through. And the later we wait, the more of this brown dead material that they just leave behind. So are there issues with stockpile fescue? Yes. Now, is there a lot of research data out there to verify this? No. And that's the issue and what we have seen for a number of years, we saw this when we lived in Kansas. We had ewes that would lamb, and they have an udder. We, re, we put them in a lambing jug. We strip a teat out. There's, uh, okay, everything's cool. The lamb, suck, the, the lamb is sucked in. It looks weak. It's up trying to nurse. And so we think everything's okay. And then the lamb gets weak and goes down, and eventually the lamb dies. And that's strange. Well, when the second time hit, we tried to milk the ewe out and we could get one squirt and that was it. She had an udder, but she would not let her milk down. And we've seen this in Arkansas as well. And so, uh, and the research station down at Boonville, Arkansas had a few years ago, they were doing a study on fescue in the winter and they lost, I think 18 lambs to starvation on this. So it, it is a serious problem. And so it, it really pushes us to, to time our use of the stockpile fescue to when it's going, when we're not lambing, or if we're, when these ewes are getting close to lambing, we need to pull them off a few days before and let that clean out of their system. If they do lamb and they don't let down their milk, we need to intervene quickly. Um, you can most people, if there are horses in the area and fescue area, your veterinarian likely has a drug called domperidone. Um, it's an oral, you can give them about five cc's of it. And within, uh, within six, eight hours, they will be letting down milk. If you don't, you just take them off of it. It's, it's more like a day or longer. And by then the lamb's dead. So it's really critical to intervene on these if you're grazing in fescue. Kim, what about, yeah. what about fescue hay? Fescue or hay is not that much of a problem because uh, the toxin levels in the hay really go down during the curing process. Fescue silage, uh, good data, Rob Collenbach at Missouri has shown that uh, those toxins are preserved in the hay. Mm -hmm. So, um, but in the, in, the uh, in, silage, in the silage, not in the hay, not in the hay. Okay. All right. So what are our winter feeding goals? And ultimately these animals have requirements based on their stage of production. And so we want to meet those requirements. And we talked about how timely this session is because going into winter is one of those critical times when you want your animals to be well fed and to, and to meet the requirements because they'll tolerate the cold better, they'll carry their pregnancy better, and they will milk more. 
coming out in, in the springtime. So it's really important time. And how we know where we're at is by monitoring body condition. I found a video, a really cool one yesterday from Australia, and I can provide that link for you, Amy, but it, it showed what part of the animal you're feeling, which is over the back, and exactly what it should feel like at the condition scores. I'm not too worried about the numbers. It, they're like one really thin to five fat. We're looking for a moderate condition and a moderate condition animal will tolerate all the stresses better and will come out milking more. Ken, you wanted to talk about the yeah. diversity. Yeah, I just want to mention that here's a picture from a few years ago of some of our sheep and, and look at the diversity that's here. We've you know, we got into the Gulf Coast natives. They're a lot smaller framed animal. We had more black face type sheep, but parasites were killing us. So we went to the Gulf Coast because they're much more parasite resistant. But it means that we've got a lot of variation in size. And, and that's real critical when we're trying to feed these animals. And how many groups can we feed in the wintertime? That's always an issue for us and something you know, one group is great, but when we have to split them up into three or four groups, that really creates problems for most of us. So, um, so variation in your flock is a, is a real negative at times when it comes to trying to winter feed these animals. So, so, so going into, if they're thin right now, we need to be feeding our animals better so that they will gain a little condition. And that's, it's easier to maintain them through the winter if they're at a good condition. So I have three pictures of goats just to kind of give an idea of what I'm talking about with the thin, moderate, and heavy. So the goat there in the middle with the orange tag, she's got some dairy breeding and that's going to impact how she looks too. But she's much thinner than her herd mates and you have to wonder why. Could be she's young and she's trying to grow at, at the same time, which means um, it's harder for her to eat enough to do everything she needs to do. But you can see the, the sunken in area there in front of her flank. That's another thing I wanted to show. We're going to look at our animals and look for them to fill out on the left side, really, not the right side. But okay, so that one I think is too thin. This one I love. I think she's perfect. She thinks she's perfect. I like how she stands like she is the queen. She's, she's got in her posture, you can just tell she feels good. Her hair coat looks great. She's got a very nice body condition. And I should add, <laughs> I should add that this picture was actually taken in March. So she's come through the winter looking like that. Of course, she's not lactating. Okay, Ken, now I'm ready. <laughs> well, it's going on so oh, Okay. Sorry. Some slides had some advancing on them, I guess. Now, this is what I consider a way over fat animal. And we don't, I guess I've never seen a sheep that was that fat, but this is not a healthy condition. This is not what we want. It took a lot of money to get her this heavy. And the thing about the thing about the goat, she doesn't put the fat on her back first. It's going inside. So she's got a big lump of fat around her kidneys and her heart, taking up space. And in our ruminant animals that are going to be carrying kids, that's a bad thing. We want as much room in there as we can so they can take in a lot of forage and digest it and grow those, those kids. So that's one problem is the, the lump of fat inside of her. It could be hard for her to get pregnant. And if she does get pregnant, you are looking at a high risk pregnancy. Because of what I said earlier about space, she's not gonna be able to eat enough. She's probably gonna lose some weight and she's at risk for pregnancy toxemia, um, ketosis and delivery problems. So this is not what we want to see. This is an overfat animal. It's not healthy. Um, yeah, don't do that. Next. Again, this is what we're looking for. And with sheep, you can't really see it. You have to feel them. You have to feel them and, and get around them. And that is one way we know, do we need to boost nutrition now so that they can put on a little bit of weight before, the, before it gets really cold? Also is a good measure of, are they eating enough of our hay? Is our nutrition program working? Uh, so this is a really important uh, management thing to do. If you can get your hands on your animals, do that. Get in the habit of feeling over there and, and just recognizing, are they gaining weight? Are they losing weight? How is their posture? How is their energy level? And assess your animals. 
Yeah, we raise wool sheep, and so the wool hides a lot. Uh, we've gone in before, and they look good. They're nice and round like we would like to see them, but then when you handle them, that backbone is really sharp, and you don't really see that unless they stay outside and the wool gets wet and mm. sinks down. So, yeah. um, so yeah, Amy, do we have any questions so far that we need to stop and answer? I have one question, and it's about feeding uh, chaff hay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Feeding chaff hay. Um, you're paying for water. You're paying for a lot of water, and you're paying for uh, you're paying for them to wrap it because uh, chaff hay has molasses in it. Uh, I mean, it's 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 good feed. It's just you're paying a lot for convenience. Of course, they eat a lot, and that could be if you had a, a, a vulnerable animal that was high value. I could understand why you might eat chaff hay, and, and, they, and they won't eat something else. Yeah, they won't eat your other hay very well. Yeah, something like that works. But it for the the thing when we do nutrition stuff, we try to put everything on a dry matter basis. Well, uh, the amount of dry—I mean, the animal requires dry matter. They can go drink water. Uh, the problem with some of these feedstuffs that are wet is you're paying a you're paying a high price for the water, so that's that's it. And you're paying for convenience. It's like molasses blocks, those kinds of things. You know, you're you're just paying for convenience. To so um, so that's my opinion on chaff hay. Fantastic. That is the right now the only question that's in the chat. So I say, keep plugging forward. Okay, so everybody's gone to sleep already. And <laughs> they, 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 oh, this is a good time for your spreadsheet then. Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So, how do we know if we're meeting that animal's requirements or not? Well, probably I've I've searched around for I've spent days literally searching around trying to find a good spreadsheet program that's easy to use that I can use when I teach sheep production class. And this is the best one I've found by far. It's on the University of Maryland website. It's www.sheepandgoat.com. And then you go to spreadsheets and they have a lot of them. They have economic budgeting spreadsheets. Uh, they have a lot of nutrition, different nutrition spreadsheets. And I know that's small, but I'm gonna just pull up a couple of pages from the from the sheep one and and look at that. I say I am. Uh, it The first tab on it has the step-by-step -step directions, which are really easy to follow. And so basically it starts out with uh, fill out your feed inventory with what you have. And so if if we know what we're feeding and we know what the nutrient composition is, we can plug that in. And for example, I sent our, we took hay samples and we sent them off and, and got those values. And I can use those values to balance, to balance the diet for my use. And that's what I've done here. But with the hay that we have in our barn right now, it's running 14% protein, which sounds great, but it's less than 60% TDN. So, it's, it's short on energy. And so what we have to do then is come in, if we wanna meet this used gestation requirements when she's carrying twins, basically we're gonna to have to feed her about a pound and a half a day of a commodity feed blend. And I wanna back up a little bit and talk just a little bit. This. What, we, what we're feeding is a five-way commodity feed. It's got corn, distillers, wheat middlings, soy hulls, and corn gluten feed. It's a mixture. Our, our, cooperative, our farmers co-op sells it, and they sell it in bulk. And so I can go buy a 1,500-pound bag. Um, it costs $200 for a 1,500-pound bag, but if you compare that with the price of uh, 1,500 pounds of sack feed, it's, it's, all, it's maybe a little over half as expensive. So it's, it's a, a good feed and it saves us a lot of money. So 
uh, that's what we're feeding in the winter time. And if you go to uh, farmers, if you go to a uh, feed store these days, most feeds are going to be based on some of those commodities like distillers, corn gluten, soybean hulls, etc. So they're going to have those in it. And so that's why I chose this. But I say a pound and a half a day is going to take to balance their requirements and and estimated that they'll eat about two and a half pounds a day. Well, where did these numbers come from? Well, on one of the tabs, it has the requirements and it, it projects that this ewe needs to eat about 3.6 pounds of dry matter a day. So that's what I'm balancing for. And so when I get it all balanced out, that exactly met their TDN or their energy, but look, protein is over because my hay has 14% protein. They don't need that much. And this commodity feed runs about, it's guaranteed at 14%, but it'll most likely run about 16. So we're over on protein. Now, something I would really, really caution you about when we're feeding these byproduct feeds, like distillers, anything that's corn-based, like distillers grains or corn gluten feed, those byproducts are very, very high in phosphorus. And so you wind up with a calcium phosphorus imbalance. Here's the phosphorus from the feed itself. And here's the requirements. Oh boy, sorry, keep hitting the button. Um, but the, so we're way over the requirement for phosphorus. So I can't take the phosphorus out so what I have to do is I have to come back and add some ground limestone. Ground limestone's cheap. You can get it in a 50 pound bag at most co-ops. And so I have to add a little bit of ground limestone to get that calcium phosphorus ratio up out of the danger zone. And so that, that's something that we really ought to point out because um, if you don't, and, and again, we speak from experience here, uh, uh, sometimes I don't sit down and balance the diets out. And I, I know it in the back of my head and I say, yeah, I need to fix the calcium, but I don't get it done. And we had uh, one year particularly, we were feeding a high fat byproduct. Fat binds calcium in the rumen of that animal. And it by, and so we, what calcium was in there, we were binding up. We had a bunch of lambs born that were bow-legged. We had them born that had undershot jaws. We had all kinds of fun stuff to happen that year. And it was all because we didn't add some of this cheap limestone to the diet. It was stupid, but you know, that's what we do sometimes. We just don't, we know better, but we do it anyway. And so, uh, so don't do that. It doesn't work. Okay. Um, question before yes. we move on. Yeah. Um, I have a question. How concerned are you with the sulfur levels in those commodity feeds? Um, okay. In a blended commodity feed, I'm not that concerned about it. Uh, if it's strictly distillers or corn gluten feed alone, then yeah, there's a, there's a potential sulfur issue. And I think the reason you're asking, that binds up copper in the rumen. And so we can create a copper deficiency with these, with these high sulfur products. We can also cause polio and cephalomalacia mm -hmm. with that. And that's, that's a fun one to deal with uh, because that sulfur will bind up thiamine in the rumen as well and cause that problem. So, uh, but these blends, I'm not, uh, I'm not really concerned about cause they're, the, I think the levels are low enough that uh, when, the, when there's the soy hulls or the wheat middlings and the corn to, to, split, to dilute it out, I don't think there's as much of an issue with it. Okay, thanks. Good question though. Uh, thanks for asking that one. That one's, that one's a potential problem. Um, throughout this whole, whole thing, and we're kind of shift our focus a little bit on intake. This whole, everything I was working on before was working on estimating that they're gonna eat what they're supposed to eat. 
that doesn't always happen. And we need to be aware of what those requirements are and how they change over time. Because if our animals aren't eating enough hay, then it doesn't matter that we're giving them that pound and a half of, of feed, they're still not gonna do well. And so when we get down to, um, as our hay quality goes down, like this is just some average quality fescue hay running about 11% protein. Um, now with that hay, the energy is less. So I have to feed more commodity feed to make it up because again, these animals are just gonna eat so much. And so to meet that energy requirement, I have to cut back on the hay, add more commodity feed. And it's even worse if the hay quality goes down and we get down in that fescue hay that was put up in late June. You know, it's uh, running about 8%, 7-8% protein. Um, it, it gets even worse. And so, but if we know the quality of our hay, we can figure this out so that we don't run into problems. And Yeah, so... Um, so when Ken showed me this earlier, it's like, aren't you concerned? Like, I don't like to see that much supplement to, because we're thinking about the, the rumen bugs inside our animals. We need to keep them healthy. Too much starch, especially too much starch in, a, in one feeding will kill them. And then you are really in trouble and you're throwing your animals off feed and, and they're not, they're not going to be able to, to do well. They could, they could even die. So um, Ken was explaining to me again that five way commodity has you we'll go ahead and say yeah it's got a it it only has about twenty percent corn and so the actual starch level is fairly low and these byproducts are high in fiber they're the seed coats of these different of these different grains and and soybeans so they're higher in fiber but the fiber is still highly digestible. And so, yes, uh, when we're feeding these levels to make sure the rumen is healthy, the rumen's made to digest fiber. Mm -hmm. And so when we start throwing in other things, uh, we do get into trouble. So when we start getting up to these higher levels of feed, we need to split that into two times, feed them twice a day. They'll utilize it better and it'll cause less negative effects on the hay intake. And I'm a lot more comfortable with, let's use a better hay rather than feed a lot of it. You think about uh, on a flock like ours, even uh, 40 ewes, that's a lot of feed. That's a lot of feed to keep in front of them. So I don't like to do that. If you are gonna feed a supplement though, let's think about, is this a good time to talk about space? Sure. Yeah, plenty of troughs. So everybody can get in there and get their share and you don't have some ewes getting twice what they should and some not getting enough. Keep those troughs clean. So you keep your animals healthy and watch them. I uh, never like to dump feed and walk away because we want to make sure everyone is going up there and eating. If somebody isn't, you have a problem. Could be that they had a slug feed yesterday and they're off their feed. And I, I think that's the time to cut back because if you start throwing your animals off feed, you got a mess. So never, never change their feed suddenly, except if you see some off feed, I think it's good to back off. Yeah, you can back quick. off quick. Build them up Build slow, them up slow. Yeah. bring them down quick, because what we've seen, if one goes off feed, well, guess what? You feed them the same amount, that means everybody else has a chance to get more, and some are probably not off feed, but they're eating slower, and so then some get more, then they go off feed, and you've just got a vicious cycle. Right. It, it's, Don't go there. It gets <laughs> ugly. Um, ideally, if you, like Linda said, if you've got good quality hay, good quality forage, and then like we heard a couple of weeks ago, the guys were talking about, you know, they don't feed. Uh, I would love to do that where I didn't have to feed, but we buy our hay, so we, we get what we get. And sometimes it's better than others, but but still we wind up having to feed to keep our use in in production because again, we're landing in December and January if we have our chance. I have three questions. I'm All not right. sure where you're going here, but I got three questions um, that I think fit with what we're talking about right now. Someone has asked about the nutritional value. I guess they feed Korean Lespedeza grass hay. 
what's the nutritional values of that kind of hay? <laughs> You take out your let, let, no, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, can we hold off on that? Sure, absolutely. Before, I'm, I'm sorry, not putting off, but I've got, I think we'll address that. Okay, here perfect. In a few um, Great then, question. then there's a question on how do you feed that limestone or calcium supplement? Do you free choice it? Is it mixed in with your blend so everybody gets it? What do you, how do you feed it? Great question there, too. Mm -hmm. We top dress it. Okay. Uh, I mean, we go out and we'll dump the feed in the bunk and and go along and just sprinkle it on top. Uh, that's the easiest way to do it uh, because our feed's already mixed. I don't mix our feed, so uh, that's uh, put. Do not <laughs> do not put it in a free choice mineral uh, because when that I, I've done that before. When you put it in a free choice mineral with with another mineral it'll set up like concrete oh. and they can't eat it once it gets wet so uh just top dress it is the easiest way yeah and, and one thing that i that i do when i'm feeding i close the gate so they cannot get around and take my knees out while i'm putting out the feed so then you can take your time and top dress and sprinkle across the top and then open the gate and let them in otherwise They'll knock you down. Been there, done that. <laughs> um, and then someone has asked, um, okay, so you're trying to balance what you have with hay and, and if you need commodity feed, where do you find these nutritional value charts so you know what you've got? Oh, that's good. Okay, the, the, that spreadsheet actually has a page that has some, some general feedstuffs in it. Uh, if you're feeding hay, you can. The best way is to send it and get it get it analyzed. Um, in the state of Arkansas, we have a forage testing, a soil testing lab that also analyzes forages, and so we'll actually get back uh, protein, energy, and if we pay extra, we can get the minerals all the way. We can, uh, so, like on our feed, our hay this year. We know our hay has 7.7 .7 parts per million copper in it. Uh, it cost us um, 50 bucks for the sample, but that does include those minerals as well. So, uh, or 40 bucks. So uh, it's it's worth it to know what you have. But sending it off to a lab that will give you the nutritive values on the hay because hay's all over the board. Um, but those other feeds. Uh, there are book values on that program University of Maryland has. Okay, um, I will try to dig that link out and drop it into the chat so that people have an easier way of right. finding it. So I'll try to try to dig that out. It was sheepandgoat.com. Sheepandgoat.com? Yeah, yeah, all one word. So, yeah. Um, and thank what thank we, you, Amy. Yeah, thanks. And great questions. Uh, keep them coming if you have them. Um, we put this in just to give us the idea that when we're talking about a dairy animal, an animal's bred to produce milk, uh, the intake is so critical. And so we can't overemphasize that. Um, let's kind of quickly talk about some other forages. We have used turnips uh, or rape, turnip rape crosses. Um, they're great. The animals will eat them readily. Um, they're, they regrow quickly in the early fall. The problem is after we have a hard freeze, they start withering up and they're so high in water that that really disrupts a lot of things and uh, they start going downhill pretty quick after a hard freeze. But if we, we have the option this is some fescue, but I uh, threw it in because I didn't have a picture of winter annuals like rye or wheat. The quality of those is extremely high. And one thing that we've had the biggest issue with them is our animals will, uh, their feces gets loose. And so that creates problems, especially with the dairy animals. Um, but uh, one thing that we, we've done with these is we use these instead of, a, a, instead of a feed stuff. All right, we can string up a fence like this and we can turn the animals out two, three hours a day and then bring them back in and use that as a supplement 
and because the quality is so high. And I like that. I'm a lot more comfortable with that as far as keeping your rumens healthy and not throwing ourselves into problems. So, yeah, and it, it, they work really well. Yeah. One thing about that, if you're grazing those and you're milking your goats, you want them off of that uh, before you take your milk because it can definitely uh, put some off flavors into the into the goat milk. Yeah, at least a couple hours because if not, it's it's bad stuff. Whew. Can't hardly drink it. All right, so. Again, we, we've talked about intake, and I am convinced that in our operation, our biggest issue is, is our animals not eating enough hay. That just is a big problem for us. And so uh, will they eat so much? What, what limits how much they eat? Well, first and foremost is their gut fill, because if they're full, they don't go out and eat. And, and this is where uh, I want to answer your question about the, about the Lespedeza is it depends. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I hate saying that, but this graph, uh, I love this figure because it's dry matter digestibility over time in the spring of five different forages. Now, this is some Wisconsin data, but it, but it fits all over the country, um, orchard grass, alfalfa, you know, alfalfa, the queen of forages, when we hear that, we perk up and say, it's great stuff. Okay, that's this purple one. What happens if we take our first cutting of alfalfa out here on June the 20th? The digestibility is, ah, sorry, the digest, I get too excited sometimes. The digestibility is still low. It's gone downhill as that plant got more mature. I love smooth brome grass. Uh, we've grazed it before. A great forage. You wait out here until until late June, the quality of it is, is poor. That fits Timothy. Quality goes down. Look at these lines. They're all almost identical except it's based on when those forages mature. So your Lespedeza hay, if if it was cut before it bloomed, it's going to be good hay. Uh, the stem is small. It's got a lot of leaves. Mm. It's going to be good hay. But if they waited until it had already set seed, it's not going to be very good hay. The protein content is going to be low, and and it's probably going to lose a lot of leaves when you're baling it and that kind of stuff. So it, it really depends on how mature that forage was. Stems are not good. Leaves are good. The more leaves, the better. So uh, you look at your hay and see, does it have a lot of leaves? If it is, and, and they don't waste those leaves when they're pulling it out, it's going to be good hay. Okay? Ho hopefully that answers it. Um, I put this in because this is kind of typical for us where if you look, there's lots of stems. They pull it out. They waste it. The hay quality is okay. And as long as they can get to the leaves, it's fine. But, but we get situations where they can't get to the leaves, and then that creates problems. Um, also, what limits intake? Acceptability of the feed. And Linda got mad at me because I was poking at her goats, but uh, those who have goats... Uh, I don't know. They can they can squeeze through cattle panels, <laughs> and they get on. They love to get on top of the hay. And so after this one stood up here for a few, for a couple hours and discharged a few times, uh, the sheep are much less likely to eat that. Now, do our lambs get on there sometimes too? Yes, Thank they you. do. <laughs> so I have to admit that. So I can. So <laughs> she won't hit me too hard. But. Um, this is how we feed hay. We use cattle panels and we cut a rung out occasionally so they don't get their head stuck so much. And, uh, but notice again, it, it's going to affect the acceptability if they're standing on it. And then another thing that we sometimes don't think about is how much forage is out there. 
uh, when we're feeding stockpile fescue, is there enough there that they're getting a full belly? Uh, or is it short where it takes them all day to get a mouthful? That's a big issue. Um, weather conditions. It's covered in snow and they're having to rake the snow back to get to it. Are they going to do that? Are they going to get enough to eat? Um, in our case, a lot of times our hay that we get has a lot of Johnson grass in it. Well, it's often baled uh, more so on yield than on quality. Mm -hmm. And so we've got some pretty healthy stems in there. And so we get in a situation where there's a lot of stems, but also do we have enough bales out there? Uh, look at, I mean, the sheep are packed tight around this bale and there's some who are really gonna have to push hard to get in there. The lambs, they're out here just taking what they can get because they don't want to get in there and fight with the ewes. Which is why I pull some out and put it on the ground so the lambs don't have to fight with the ewes. And so it's easier for them to find those leaves and get the, the very best out of it. Yeah, and that's what here, if you look, look at all this right in this area are stems. And so that's what we see is they'll pick the leaves off and leave the stems. And so we need to go out there pretty often, like every day or every other day and, and pull the stems out, throw them on the ground, uh, let them help build organic matter and um, and that way they have more leaves to eat. And you, you know the difference because as soon as you do that, they hit the bales hard. Uh, another situation, notice how far in they have eaten on these round bales. And so they've eaten in all sides as far as they can. And so every so often we need to come out there and take the top and flip it over so they can get to it. Um, and that's very satisfying, like you said, the, the sheep pretty much say thank you when you, but you have to make sure that they're going to be able to get it. And I think if you are reaching into your hay feeder to pull hay out, if it's hard for you, think how hard it is for them. And so we, we do need to be mindful of making it easy. There's a trade-off between the waste and the intake. And I rather err on the side of being sure they can get enough to eat. Yeah, they need to get enough to eat, and and we think about waste. But you know, when we think about how much we pay for the hay, we we've, we've kind of taken a different approach on this. Uh, notice how short this lot is. This is a this is a pasture that uh, we've got our pastures divided up into smaller cells, and so uh, they have. Uh, sorry, um, we. This was last winter. This summer, I planted sorghum sedan in here. And so by, by pinning the ewes in here, keeping this organic matter there, keeping the nitrogen that they excreted in their feces and urine all in this one lot, uh, my sorghum sedan grew really well. And so that's what we've kind of taken the, the more of the holistic approach. I, I figured the other day, based on the protein content of our hay this year, we are, uh, each bale has 20 pounds of nitrogen in it. And, you know, as most of us know, nitrogen fertilizer is usually the first limiting nutrient in plant growth. So uh, we've got 20 pounds of nitrogen there and the sheep aren't gonna use it very effectively. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast. And so that's coming out in the urine and feces on this pasture that we can then use for fertilizer next year. And that wasted hay is gonna add organic matter, which we are always glad to get more of that too for soil health. Yeah, because our soil is shallow. Uh -huh. And so we need all the help you we have, can get. You guys have better soil up there, I think. And so, um, Other limitations, weather. You know, like in this picture, these sheep are out there tearing into it. I took this picture and then immediately turned to the right and took this picture. And notice out here, there's a whole bunch of sheep out here and they've got snow on their back and they've been out eating the hay. The goats are in the barn and our dairy goats particularly, when it sprinkles, they head for the house. Um, and that's a big issue. Those animals, they need to eat. And when, they, when it rains, when we've got a day where it's rained off and on all day long, 
milk production absolutely tanks. I mean, it, it drops off an amazing amount. And when they go back and eat, it comes back. But for that day, you lost a lot of production. So these are all things that impact intake. And, you know, and we think about it, intake, uh, I like this picture because this looks like a pretty good meal for me. If I sit down and I ate this, I would be pretty full. It would definitely meet my requirements. But what if I cut one little bitty corner off of this and that's all I ate and ate one little thing of cucumber here, is that gonna take care of me? No, it's not. And that's the same thing for our animals. It can be high quality stuff, but if they don't get enough to eat, it doesn't really help them enough. So um, that kind of gets us through what we had. Except I want you to go back up the slide, oh, please. Oh, she does, okay. Uh, one more, please. One more, all right. Yes. That's our website for ATRA in the lower corner there in the gold. So it's atra.ncat.org. And I wanna encourage you to go there to the homepage and look under livestock and, and pasture, click into there and then We've got a library practically about sheep, especially internal parasite stuff, grazing stuff, general production information, direct marketing information, podcasts, videos, and publications. I really encourage you to check it out. We've done podcasts recently about livestock guardian dogs and animal health and internal parasites. And last year, a big series on direct marketing lamb. So I think if you listen to podcasts, it's called Voices from the field, you can also access it from the website. You can reach the specialists for ATRA who work for you at 800-346-9140. We answer phones Monday through Friday, and almost all of our specialists are farmers or have been in the past, and I think, um, I think people should take more advantage of the service of the ATRA information service, so. I have linked the ATRA page in the chat, so people don't even have to type it. They can just go and click on it. I've also linked the Maryland Small Ruminant page for those that ration calculator and those nutritional values, so people can just hit that link. Great. I do have two questions in the comments. Um, the first is, we graze in the Missouri woods with a variety of hardwoods, oak, hickory. What impact can those fall leaves have on that forage? Uh. I, I don't have a really good answer, but there's some real issues here. Uh, one are the acorns. We've, we've had some questions in our area about uh, acorn toxicity, because I guess they just fill up the rumen, they've got, they're high in tannic acid. And so it's hard to combat uh, them overeating on acorns. Um, another thing is different kinds of leaves when they when they first fall, they they have some compounds in them that act as they're turning. They have some compounds in them that will actually bind up all the calcium and create some problems that way too. Uh, some oxal oxalic acid, is, and so yeah, you can you can get into trouble if they eat too many leaves. Is this and goats? Is the uh, uh, it doesn't say if it's sheep or goats. So Adele, if you want to let me know which one you've got here. Um, I've always found that as sheep, I mean, they treat leaves like chips. Like they'll just eat and eat and eat and eat leaves. So they don't use sometimes leave enough room in their belly for real food. Um, question here. What do you do when you discover slight mold inside your round bales? Mm -hmm. What is the damage that undiscovered mold can do to your goats? Uh, round bales have a tendency to mold in certain layers. Yeah. What is your advice there? Uh, we try to peel it off um, and throw it to the side. I, we really, in our animals, we haven't had an issue with them actually eating the mold. Hey, they, they pick through it. Uh, but it, yeah, uh, I, I'm doing that right now. Uh, this morning pulled out the moldy stuff, throw it to the side so they have fresh to eat. Uh, but the actual harm, some of it's going to depend on their stage of production. You know, molds I, can cause abortions. 
Um, but generally speaking, it's the big issue I think is it's probably going to keep them from eating it if you don't go peel that off and just throw it off to the side somewhere. That's my opinion. What do you think? Yeah, I think of another thing that I wanted to to say is a bale that lasts a long time is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. If if they're not wanting to eat it or they're not eating it, that's that's not a good thing. So. Um, I keep an eye out for that. And you can see they vote with their, they vote with their mouth. You know, if they're eating a bale really readily, I, I like to see why is that? Why are they not eating this other one? What can I do to make it easier for them to get the other one eaten? And sometimes with our uh, dairy goats, I've used a little bit of alfalfa to kind of top dress a lower quality hay to like, coax them to eat more of it. Um, I don't know, what do you think about spraying molasses on, not moldy hay, I'm not saying a bad no. quality thing, I don't want them to eat that. You could do that, spraying molasses, there's actually some companies that, that uh, they'll have a spike that you can squirt molasses in there. Personally, I, I think, um, I mean, that, that'll help them eat it better. Molasses for what you get is expensive, mm. but, um, yeah, that would help them eat it a little better. Sheep, though, or, uh, what I've noticed about sheep and molasses is they don't seem to like getting that on their nose. <laughs> and they, they seem to, uh, they don't eat it like cattle do. So uh, that's what I've noticed anyway. But. The um, producer with the, the question about leaves, she raises goats. I don't think I'd worry about it, but what is their body condition like? How are they, do they seem to be thriving? How's their coat shine? And uh, I bet they're picking up persimmons and, uh, and maybe some other things too. Okay, so um, we've got just a couple more minutes here. So if anybody that's listening has any questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. Um, I have posted the survey monkey, so if you guys could take a couple of minutes and fill out that survey monkey, there's maybe eight or nine questions. Um, for those that have participated, um, we do have certificates for participation, so um, make sure that I have a way to contact you, either an email address or something so that I can get it sent out to you. Uh, if we have any repeat offenders from last week, um, I have sent out certificates for those that attended previously, so I guess two weeks ago. So if you did not receive one, let me know and I will get it sent to you. Amy, were you able to do anything with those resources that I emailed you? I will post them following this um, so that it's linked to this topic. Um, so you guys that are on now, if you want to check back in at a little bit, uh, Linda has sent some good resources I'll make sure are posted in this conversation so you can find them. And again, ATRA's website is there. Um, the Maryland Ruminant has a whole lot of great information, so definitely check that one out. Um, all I'm getting now is compliments. You guys did a great job and they're very appreciative, so I'm not seeing any more questions. Okay, thanks so, for inviting us. Yeah. And uh, can I make one last point here? Sure. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I know Bruce was talking about, and I think I mentioned this earlier, about selecting your animals that fit your environment. And, and that's really important. I mean, we, but in our case, we, we've tried to really push them hard and really cut back on the supplement. And in our case, that just, we haven't been able to make that work, but it's because of our lambing season. Um, and so uh, designing your lambing season with your forage program and what you have, when your marketing is, uh, all of that is all of that comes into play when we're trying to figure out how to feed these animals. I've had one last question, then I'm going to cut them off. Do you ever unroll your big bales or do you just put them like in bale rings? We, we do. Linda prefers that. Um, but And I, I like doing it too, except the one thing that happens is, first thing that happens is they're going to stand on that. And so you're going to have to accept, I think, more waste doing it that way, unless you're really careful. Go ahead. I like I'm to sorry. put out, I like to put out a small amount. We've got enough ewes and lambs in there. I like to undo my bale ring and peel off a layer and, you know, lay it out, stretch out. I want everybody 
we do be able to get up and eat at once. And I'm only going to put out what they're going to clean up in just a couple of hours. So I'm reducing, minimizing that waste that he's talking about. I just really want to see them get full. And so I think laying it out and unrolling it is, is a really good thing to do. And I like to do that. And then I close up the rest of it. So you know, I'm not unrolling an entire bale because our flock is too small for that to to really work because of the reasons he said, and because it's true, my goats would get on it and use it for a bed. Um, and, and think about it in terms of holistic nutrient management. You unroll that bale in a place, uh, you do that in a place where you need organic matter. Mm -hmm. uh, don't do it in a dry lot. Uh, mm -hmm. Do it out on a pasture somewhere where you're capturing where you're still trying to capture those nutrients. And so it's not as much of a loss that way. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So having your soil tests and knowing which parts of your farm need that fertility, that helps us decide where we're gonna feed our hay this year. And then yes, if, if it's, especially if it's tough weather, if it's getting really cold, or I'm just looking at their condition and thinking they're not eating enough, I'm happy to unroll that and, and make sure that they're gonna get plenty, so. Well, Linda, Linda and Ken Coffey, uh, we are so grateful to you. You have been sharing so amazing things uh, and put together, putting together many different things in a very understandable way. We thank you so much for your time, for your experience, and for sharing all these things here at Lincoln University. And we thank you. Um, I don't know if you want to just to say it, uh, some other words and, and allow to Amy to make an announcement for our next uh, topic. Yeah, so I am gonna put in a plug on November 19th, uh, Dr. Chris Boffman, who is the veterinarian here in our small ruminant program is gonna talk about COVID-19 and livestock. Um, he's gonna talk about sort of a historical perspective and then risk of transmission and those kinds of things. So. So be sure to log into our Facebook page and uh, view the presentation that's November 19th, starting at noon. And we are very grateful, Ken and Linda, that you were able to speak with us today. Um, there are a lot of great questions um, and I didn't ever have to stop you and slow you down. So you did great. Hey, we'd be glad to come back again. Thank you for having us. Yeah, you've been great to work with. Glad count, to count on being invited, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. Thank you so much. Yep. So I think we will.